Hello, and welcome to the Purdue AggieCon podcast, the podcast for experts and innovators in agriculture. I'm Haley Fisher. On today's episode, Dr. Foster and I have a discussion with Ukrainian research economist Maxine Chepelev on both the energy and agricultural dimensions of the Russian-Ukraine war and the role of Purdue's community during this time of crisis. Stay tuned. Hello, you're listening to the Purdue Agricultural Economics Podcast. I'm your host, Ken Foster, from the Department of Agricultural Economics at Purdue University. And with me is my co-host, Haley Fisher, who is a junior studying agricultural economics and political science here at Purdue. So I think all of our listeners are aware of the events that are taking place in Europe, the invasion of Ukraine by Russian forces. And it turns out that here in our department, we have Ukrainian research economist who works for the Center for Global Trade Analysis in the Department of Agricultural Economics, and that's Dr. Maxim Chepilev. So, Maxim, how are you today? Thanks. I'm good. Yeah. Awesome. So, Maxim, maybe give us a little bit of background about yourself. You still have family in Ukraine? Yeah, yeah. So, both my family, my parents, and I have siblings, brothers, and sisters in Ukraine, and my wife's family is also in Ukraine. Yeah. So. Um, and I'm, I'm originally from Kyiv, this is a capital city, yeah, so all my friends are essentially there. And um, so I graduated back in 2016 from the National Academy of Sciences and got my PhD there in economic modeling. And then just right after that, I moved to the GTAP Center. And are you in contact with your family? Yeah, yeah, well, considering the circumstances, you know, to the extent they could be, but we are in contact every day, so we are calling each other, checking. Well, we'll be thinking of them, and I know our listeners mm-hmm. will also keep them in their thoughts and prayers, so just mm-hmm. know that we're um, we're with you and, and mm-hmm. we're thinking of them. So maybe give us a little bit of background about Ukraine and Russia and their importance to the broader global economy. Yeah, sure. So... Um, both Ukraine and Russia, and also Russian closest ally Belarus, which which should be also taken into account, they are major players on commodity markets. Um, so first, of course, and I assume many of listeners know, um, the Black Sea region is is a major supply of agricultural crops, wheat, um, corn. Um, oil seeds, um, also um, sunflower seeds, sunflower oil, um, so barley. Um, so the, the region accounts for between 10, 15% of, of global supply. So um, sending crops to, to um, around the world to Europe, the Middle East and North Africa and, and, and other regions. Um, so the second um, commodity market that is um, kind of largely represented by this region are fertilizer. So um, Belarus and Russia, they, uh, they are top second and, and third producers of potash fertilizer um, globally, um, just after Canada, which is the first um, producer, the largest oh. producer. And, and they ship fertilizer to Europe, but also to Brazil, for instance. And, and Brazil uses the fertilizer to, um, to, to grow to grow soybeans, which are then exported to China. So essentially any kind of disruptions in the supply of fertilizer can, can impact um, throughout Brazil and then China. And then of course China uses soybean to, uh, to feed their livestock. So essentially could have an implications for meat market. So with all this connected. And then the third dimension is of course energy. Russia is a huge energy supplier, um, exporting um, oil, natural gas, petroleum products, also coal, um, and any disruptions in supply or even market expectations would impact global prices of energy. And that's what we are already observing and again penetrating through the economy, both directly through price impacts for households and intermediate users, but also indirect, indirectly since energy is an input to for instance, um, agricultural transportation, yeah, which would again impact their cost of production. So, um, these are essentially the three channels. Yeah. So maybe just a little bit of a follow-up on the agricultural side. It's springtime there, so planting 
of some of these crops would have happened probably last fall because I'm guessing the barley and the wheat are winter wheat. So those crops are, are growing. What do we know about the current, I guess, state of agricultural production in Ukraine? Yeah, so um, in terms of the harvest from the previous year, uh, Ukraine has already shipped between 70 and 80 percent of the harvest. So the, the remaining 20 percent are still in storage and considering the current situation, it's very unlikely that this would be shipped because um, all the ports in the southern part of Ukraine are currently closed, so they, they do not operate. Um, now the harvesting, well, the, the planting season has began just a couple of weeks ago in Ukraine, and then I've seen reports that um, planting has started, but at a relatively limited territory. Yeah, so in in the western part of Ukraine and central part of Ukraine, where there is no direct um, um, kind of conflict there, the planting can uh, be implemented, but in, in like northern parts and in some southern parts, it's more problematic. So um, the Ministry of Agriculture, of course, it's, it's of Ukraine is putting all efforts to support farmers to plant in whatever territories they can, but, but presumably this would impact their possibilities of exporting uh, wheat and other grains in the next season. Well, let's, let's turn our attention to the energy side because, you know, there's been a lot of talk about economic sanctions on Russia, but those stop short of doing anything that directly affects uh, the energy sector, the energy exports of Russia. And it turns out you re recently written a paper on this topic and, as I understand it, made a presentation to the EU Parliament last week on that particular subject. What, what can you tell us about, I guess, in a, in a higher level, maybe what, what your research entailed and maybe some of the highlights of what you discovered in evaluating what would happen if we further restricted energy exports from Russia to the EU, if I'm not mistaken? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah sure. So um, energy, energy imports from Russia to you is a very sensitive, uh, of course, question for you since it imports around third, or in, in some cases 40% of its energy from, from Russia. So unlike, for instance, US or UK who have already announced that they would cut imports of energy sources from Russia, uh, for you the share is much larger and that's why they are much more hesitant to do that. Um, now, saying that, we've seen that during the last um, week, Poland and Lithuania have already announced that they would cut uh, uh, imports of energy, of fossil fuels from Russia. Um, and indeed, we have, together with uh, colleagues from, from the GDAP Center, Dominique van der Mesbroek and Tom Hertel, we have uh, written a paper on the potential impacts of uh, restricting Russian energy imports to Europe and, and also some other OECD countries. And so the paper was first published in WOXEU, and then it was picked up by one of the uh, representatives of European Parliament, and, and uh, we have been invited to attend a round table, uh, which was held last, last Thursday um, on March 31st. And the main idea of the round table was to show that actually implications of restricting energy imports from Russia for EU are not so um, so huge and so uh, tremendous as some politicians have discussed during the initial kind of setting of, of, of this topic. And one of the main issues with kind of pushing this message was that um, just after the war began, especially in Germany, but also in other countries, there was a pretty substantial industrial lobby um, not to restrict any imports. And the rhetoric started to be pretty black and white. So either, either no restrictions at all or full restriction. And then, and then when talking about full restrictions, like policymakers were saying that the European economy was just shut down if, if there would be any, any restrictions. And then after that, economy started to speak up, speak up with, with the estimates showing that, well, no, there are a lot of channels that, that would allow to A, substitute energy imports, B, increase domestic production, C, reduce demand. So with, with taking into account all these three channels and then, 
and beyond, the, the impacts would not be so dramatic. And, and that was the main topic of, of uh, the round table and the main message that we tried to, to reveal to policymakers. One of the things that I saw in the news this week is that Russia is demanding that members of the EU pay for their oil and natural gas in rubles. Does that affect this analysis in any meaningful way? So, yeah, that's, that's an interesting question because it's essentially not clear how it would be set up kind of formally. From, from the uh, analysis that I have seen, um, EU would still be able to pay in euros. It would be just there would be um, an additional intermediary that would be exchanging euros to rubles. And, and thus, apparently, the impacts might not be so dramatic in terms of you know, uh, currency exchange and so on. But so far, not a single EU country has um, supported this kind of demand. So EU is still paying in euros. But, but of course, we'll see how, how the situation will change. And, and so, I mean, I guess one would assume that elasticity of demand from EU might be such that relative to Russian supply elasticity might be such that the Russians just have to take whatever currency the EU offers in the end if they want to export their energy. Yeah, yeah. That's, I mean, I mean yeah. it's a market power issue in a sense, a relative market power issue here. Yeah, yeah, because um, Russia exports around 50% of their uh, fossil fuels to EU, so EU is a huge market. And, and if EU bans or substantially restricts imports from Russia, for Russia it won't be easy to, to relocate a substantial amount of this energy volume elsewhere, like to China, for instance, the second larger um, demander. So for, for EU, stakes are much lower than for Russia. And, and based on our estimates, looking into potential impacts of these restrictions, we find that on average, Russia would lose 10 times more than the EU in relative terms, for instance, in, in terms of real income or GDP. So taking into account sizes of economy and, and all the interlinkages. So that's approximately what is at stake for, for each of, of, of two regions. Yeah. So when you say these potential impacts on the EU are relatively modest, I mean, what are we talking about? I mean, and, and you're not talking about a 100% elimination of EU imports. You're talking about some fractional reduction. What's that fraction and what are your estimated real income effects on EU consumers? Yeah, so we have been looking into the reduction of imports between 70 and 90 percent, so a pretty substantial cut from, from of the Russian portion. And what we have found that is that in terms of real income uh, impacts, they would not exceed 1, 1.5 percent in terms of real income kind of growth. So presumably, for instance, if, if EU is expected to grow 3% in 2022, so their cut of uh, energy imports from Russia would would reduce this growth rate to 2%, to 1.5%. And, and interestingly, uh, we also did a comparison with other models um, from, from other groups that did, that did similar estimates and not a single has shown an impact of more than 3%. So between 1% and 2%, that's kind of a central estimate from, from many models, yeah. Yeah, and how does environment factor into this and that, that perspective of looking at that? Because I know that Europe has made promises of cutting down greenhouse gas emissions and all of their promises. So how does this, the fossil fuels, affect that? Yeah, so we have also looked into kind of longer term implications of this mm -hmm. move. And actually what we found that um, these restrictions would help to achieve the European Green Deal targets, which is a 55% reduction in emissions in 2030 relative to 1990 level. And, and we find that the cutting of, of Russian energy imports could, is equivalent to a 40 euro per ton of CO2 carbon price. So. This would reduce the UETS carbon price by, by around 40 euro in the longer term by, by 2030. Yeah? So uh, we also find some substantial environmental benefits in terms of reducing air pollutants, like particulate matter, nitrous oxide. Uh, and, and that's also a very important point because um, 
air pollutants cause a substantial number of deaths in, in, uh, in the EU every year, like uh, more than 100,000 de deaths a year. So reducing those would also reduce the mortality in, in European Union. So there is this, indeed, a short-term kind of rel relatively um, kind of adverse and negative impact, but in the long run, there are substantial environmental benefits that largely overweigh this kind of short-term and initial negative implications. You Another point you talked about in your paper was the effects on EU households. Could you touch on that a little bit, too? Yeah, yeah. So one of the key kind of points that well, both policymakers and you know consumers in general are worried about is an increase in energy prices. And somewhat, you know, unfortunately, energy prices have already been increasing even before the war started due to you know, high demand following the uh, COVID pandemic and also attacks on Saudi Arabia oil facilities, which disrupted the supply and a number of other factors. So th this has been pushing up the uh, global both gas and, and oil prices. And then the war started, which, which came on top of this. And even be before any country started announcing any restrictions, of course, markets expectation has shifted that there could be a potential disruptions in supply. So this pushed the energy prices further. And, and we are now observing an increases in, in electricity prices in EU, quite, quite substantial, and also natural gas prices, which of course pushes their consumer price index up, yeah. Um, so, but, but what we find is that despite this kind of shorter term uh, price implications um, in, in the longer term, or at least within the next year, year and a half, we, we do not expect a major increases in, in energy prices from the restrictions itself. So our estimate is that energy prices would uh, increase by between 10 and 15 percent. And taking into account that the share of energy in total household consumption expenditures is, is around 10 percent, 8 to 10 percent, in some countries up to 15 percent. So this would translate into consumer price increases of around 1% up to 2%. Um, of course, there are some more vulnerable households which spend more on, on, on energy and, and transportation, lower income households. And, and there might be a need to um, design some specific targeted policies to support these households in EU, especially in uh, um, lower income EU countries like Bulgaria and Romania. So still there would be a need to, to do this selective policy uh, interventions, but but on average for middle income and high income households, we do not find this very large inflationary pressure from from this move. So that that brings, I guess, another question to my mind, and that is that in the short run, uh, the EU will have to look elsewhere for at least some of its energy, some of its oil and natural gas. What are the impacts, I guess, on less wealthy countries that might currently be consuming those resources if they're bid away by higher income EU users? Yeah, so um, of course there are implications which are heterogeneous around the world. So some countries would be able to benefit from this, like large energy producers, um, Saudi Arabia, you know, Middle East and North African countries, uh, Europe and Central Asia, so like Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, large energy exporters. So we find that those countries would would benefit from this because energy prices are increasing and that someone would need to substitute at least partially the lost Russian demand uh, supply. So, so uh, there are regions that would benefit from this. Uh, but at the same time with rising global energy prices, because consumers in net energy importing countries, uh, like Turkey, for instance, which is a large importer of natural gas from Russia, uh, they might be you know, adversely impacted. What keeps this from just being a shell game in, in a sense that Russia may export their oil and natural gas to someone else who may turn around and export it to the EU, but at higher prices? Well, so uh, first we uh, we rely on you know, the role of legislation and politicians in order to prevent this, yeah, to to uh, to prevent this kind of free exports. Uh, but 
at the same time, the share of Europe in, in total Russian energy supply is really large, like 50%. Yeah, so reallocating all these flows through, through another supplier could be technically just very, very uh, complicated and I would say almost impossible. Yeah, for instance, you need to supply natural gas through the pipeline and, and you know, doing this through, through another pipeline would be simply technically you know, very complicated. At the same time, increasing kind of supply to other destinations is, for, for the case of Russia, it's also pretty kind of hard because there is not so much demand, let's say, from China, which would need to expand, uh, let's say, its production many times to, to um, kind of receive so much energy. One, one aspect here is that, well, so Russia would, even if Russia would face reducing demand from Europe with globally rising energy prices, this would compensate the revenue flow. So that's one of the concerns that you know, we, uh, economists are considering. So there is this trade-off and it's not clear to what, how uh, global prices would react uh, to, to this move. So. How can the Purdue community, how can Purdue students, what is our role in this? How can we best support the situation here? So um, the Purdue community has already been very receptive to, um, to the Russian invasion to Ukraine. Um, so there have been several um, events where Purdue students and faculty and staff have been um, showing uh, their support to Ukraine you know, in March and um, Purdue community has also uh, contributed by collecting um, goods and, and sending them to Ukraine. Mm -hmm. um, um, well, I, I think there are several um, kind of uh, future um, avenues to support. So, of course, we as, as, as the researchers, as faculty and staff can tr contribute to their discussion and of, of this um, kind of issues, um, the policy debate, so to um, in this agenda, of course, you know, continuing the support, we are um, additional stand for Ukraine events and uh, and other these types of uh, action is, is also very important. So that their information campaign kind of continues to show what um, what is happening in Ukraine. Yes, yeah, so the, the impacts of Russian war, and uh, it's it's very important that this keeps up and then this continues in, in the informational space. Yeah, and uh, I don't know how many of our listeners are aware, but Purdue has also created a program for Ukrainian scientists to come and spend time at Purdue. They have uh, financial support available to them and they work with Purdue faculty and students to continue some of their research here at Purdue so and contribute to research programs at Purdue. So Purdue's been, as an institution, I think has been very active in this regard. And then I guess, you know, everybody can continue to express their opinions, whichever opinion they might have to their representatives in terms of uh, continued material support to uh, Ukrainian efforts. So, Maxime, any further comments before we sign off? Thoughts? Well, I well, I would just like to thank you for inviting me here, for providing an opportunity to comment on, on our research and on situation in my home country in general, and, and I hope listeners enjoy this podcast. And thank you. Yeah, well, thank you, thank and thank you. you for undertaking this research. And <laughs> yeah. I think it just highlights this department and its active role in addressing current issues when they arise, and we appreciate you tackling this one. I know it's personal for you, and we appreciate you taking the time to to be with us. You've been listening to the Purdue Agricultural Economics Podcast. You can visit the department at www.agecon.purdue.edu. You can follow us on Facebook and like us on Twitter, or maybe you follow us on Twitter and like us on Facebook, either one. All right, have a great day and a wonderful spring. Thank you.